Bravo with Food and Water Watch. We are an international nonprofit, and uh, we are here in New Mexico now since about two years with an office. We've worked here for about four years, and uh, we have some very specific needs that we're addressing here in New Mexico. Now, we all know that Senate Bill 18 is an amendment to the New Mexico Food Act and will require the labeling of genetically engineered or genetically modified foods that are sold in the state of New Mexico. And after we all meet each other, then I will go into more detail on this nationally. As you may know, that there was what was called Proposition 37 in the state of California, uh, which was a ballot initiative, a little bit different than what we're doing here in New Mexico. Uh, in California, there were um, there was about a 35. That was a, a full vote for the whole population, and about uh, 35 points separated the yay and the nay. Uh, our organization uh, spearheaded a, a lot of the support. We did close the gap to about four percent, but Monsanto and other agribusinesses spent $47 million uh, telling the people of California that labeling, simply labeling, would ra substantially raise the cost of their grocery bill. And that was enough to keep people away from, from the polls and keep people from voting. But it was not a failure. Uh, we now have uh, uh, another legislative effort in the state of Washington and in Connecticut, and we are doing this in those states, similar to what we're doing here in New Mexico, from Food and Water Watch. There's also other states that are moving towards labeling, Florida, I think, and a couple of other states. Yes. Are you expecting the same massive influx of money that went into California to come here? I was hoping we could fly under the radar, but the bill was pre-filed a few days before Christmas. Uh, we sent out a press release 15 minutes after we pressed enter. I was pretty much inundated from all over the country, including St. Louis paper, which is Monsanto's home state. So they're, they're going to be gunning for us um, because they have a big stake in not getting labeled. But, you know, we are willing to have a conversation. And I've given you what I think is some important information to help you with some language, how to address some of these questions, because you are the folks who are going to be going out in the community. So l let me just give you a little bit of background. And anyone who knows more about the legislative process, please chime in. Um, the bill is being introduced into the Senate so, because we felt this was the best place and the best place for success. We did do a pretty extensive legislative analysis as to who to ask to introduce the bill. We certainly looked at southern New Mexico where there's a lot of agriculture. Uh, we couldn't find anybody who was really willing, we thought could really push the bill, would really um, put it forward. Um, so we decided to ask Senator Worth. I brought allies with me. We sat down with him. He said yes. Uh, Food and Water Watch provided the basis for the for the language in the bill, based on a bill that was being introduced in Washington. We, we sent it to the legislative writer, um, and it went through five or six drafts with our food policy person. So, uh, after about five drafts, uh, we were fairly satisfied. The bill can be tweaked, but it, it's pre-filed now. And uh, originally, we we were planning on not pre-filing it, but then everyone found out, and Senator Worth said, let's, let's just go ahead. So, um, because our legislators, our senators, are pretty much volunteer, they don't have staff, so Food and Water Watch is spearheading the support for, for the advocacy for this campaign. So initially, what will happen, I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the bill will go to committees, Senate committees, and we suspect it's going to go to conservation and then to judicial. Now, as you know, we've had an election. We don't really know who's going to be on these committees until the session starts, which will be January 15th. Now, we, we can, Senator Worth has given us his best guess as to who is going to be on the committees but we really don't know that much about conservation. We lost Dede Feldman, Eric Riego, a lot of progressives. 
Um, so these are going to be our first line of, of targets for this campaign. If some people think everyone's going to be able to vote on this. I've had so many phone calls saying, when do we vote? We never vote. And maybe all of you understand this. This is not something that's going out on a ballot and everybody gets to vote. It is our lawmakers who are going to be going through the process of bringing this. And it is, and I want to be clear, it is not a standalone bill. It is an amendment to the New Mexico Food Act, but it has a Senate bill number. And the reason that we are doing this, hi. The reason that we made it as an amendment is because we felt that this was the best and easiest way of, for the language to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. Now, I know that there has been other legislation introduced into the state of Mexico. Miguel, you know a lot about that, and I know some about it. I think this particular amendment is different than, the, than some of the other efforts. For one thing, um, it is purely a consumer bill. It, it, it does not, it's not agricultural, uh, and the main reason for that is because we wanted to have some control over what committees it went to. So it is purely right to know. And I would like to, you to all be very clear in your own minds when you talk to people, because we, we do feel that labeling will benefit everyone who is involved in food, in food sales, in food production, in, in growing food. Uh, but because of the incredible comprehensiveness of GMOs scientifically and socially, uh, we feel that this is a place to start. And we will take it as far as we possibly can. Alan and Mary, you have phone call in one please. Alan, one please. We don't know whether this will become a law this year, next year, or 2015. We have a uh, governor that who knows? But the purpose for our effort here and our legislative effort is the way Food and Water Watch works is in, this is our model as a nonprofit, and we do this all over the world, is that we bring constituent pressure onto lawmakers. And that's what the reason that when I walk into an, uh, an office with a senator, I always bring a constituent with me. And if I walk into my own senator and say, Senator Sapien, he's my, he's my senator, John Sapien, I want you to do this. Um, it's true, I'm one person. But if we can bring 1,000 or 5,000 petition signatures and 50 organizations like La Montanita, like Earth Care, that represent another 10,000 people, this means more to to our legislators. And our attitude towards lawmakers is that they work for us that when they get elected, they do not become a new member of royalty. They have to vote our wishes. And this is our way of telling them that this is what we want. So we want them to vote for labor. So any questions at this point? Yes. So procedurally, does the bill go to the different committees and the committees have to vote yes for it to stay alive? Is that yes. how that works? And yes. then at the end, does it come in front of the whole Senate? Senate? Yes. And they have Senate. to pass it? Yes. And, and then, then, so our strategy then, changes. So then we target these senators. And we will be doing a very extensive online campaign through Food and Water Watch. And we will be entering all these petition signatures that you all are going to gather. And we will, part of the reason that we are here in Santa Fe and working in Albuquerque is another way to bring pressure against lawmakers is not only with their constituents, but with the people who give money to their campaigns. And this is where the money comes from. Yes. Uh, so your strategy is just to introduce this in the Senate? Yes. Uh, not the House. The not the House. Time. But then, it, if it passes the Senate, it goes to the House, correct? And then we go through the same thing. So as the session continues, our strategy will then change with it. So it's pretty much of an unknown. We know some of, our, of, the, of the legislators that need to be targeted. So right now, um, what we need from you is coalition partners. And if you are here or as a representative of an organization, if you can sign on 
to a letter and I will email it to you. You can take it to your board that says we as an organization support this bill. Basically that's what the letter says. And yes. Um, so Miguel will know this much better than I, but when the bill goes to a committee, and I don't know if there are like two or four committees, how many committees, I think there are four committees, but when it goes to the committee, we do have an opportunity ahead of time to find out who's on the committee, yes. so that we can contact them. Um, the hard part comes when the bill is scheduled to be heard, it seldom is heard at that time, but what we need are watchdog groups to sort of, and we can, we can coordinate that so, you know, no, not the same people get exhausted because it's exhausting to have to sit there for hours and hours, but we can maybe develop some watchdog groups to um, schedule, okay, it's supposed to be heard at 3.30 on Monday, because in all likelihood it's going to get, you know, rescheduled to midnight or not even heard at all. But the point is to, to try to maybe set up a text thing and to contact everybody because we need to fill up those committee rooms. Uh, you know, there will be people from the other side, so to speak, who will be in those committee rooms speaking on their behalf. We need to speak on behalf of this. So I think that's another thing that we want to try to coordinate, to have as many bodies in the, in the hearings as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. And Senator, Senator Worth will be trying to communicate the schedule as best he can. And as you said, sometimes it's unknown until the 11th hour. Yes. Oh. Does the public get to comment when it goes to committee? It depends. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, right? You never know. We were there for the Farmer Protection Act in 2010. We had the room packed, and uh, and the chair never recognized us. Nobody. No, so we didn't even get to speak. You know, all the lobbyists for the other side got to speak. Yeah, really? Uh, if any of you know Cliff Bain, Cliff Bain from Taos stood up and uh, and insisted that the people be allowed to speak. Um, my opinion is that by the time it's heard in committee, it's already decided on. It's already too late to voice your opinion. To me, all the work has to be done backstage. Uh, that's what the lobbyists are doing, you know. And and it's all, in my opinion, it's all relationship building. It's not attacking and uh, and getting these people to understand where you're coming from. You know, applying pressure where necessary. You know, to let them know who's standing behind you, but uh, but really approaching this is uh, you know relationship type of building. You know, I will tell you that uh, if this goes to conservation committee, you know they call the conservation committee the kill committee. So um, in my opinion and experience, if it goes to conservation committee, that's where it's going to be seen and that's where it's going to die. In uh, and we'll know sooner than later. But farmer protection, the first time we did farmer protection in 2009, <laughs> it went to that committee and it died there. And who, didn't even live five who decides minutes. what committee goes to? It's the Senate Majority Leader? It is. Michael Sanchez, currently. Uh, it was him last time. And, uh, you know, so. Well, we will be having a new conservation committee this time around. And I absolutely agree with you. The work it starts now. And it, unfortunately, it's probably all too true that by the time it gets heard, it's already been decided. That's why we will be setting up appointments, and I'll be asking every one of you if you know someone who lives in that person's district, and then you, we go together, and we sit down with that person, and we shake their hand, and we say, this is what we would like. How does that work for you? Yes. Is it worthwhile for us to start working with Michael Sanchez right away to see if we can get the committees that we want? Um, and ask him not to kill it in conservation? He is, is uh, we have been working with him. I think contacting him would be great. Um, it, you know, it's, it, he doesn't know anything yet either, whether he's going to be on that committee. We have sort of been promised a good conservation committee, but we, we never know. But we certainly, it certainly would be great if he would hear from people saying we support this bill. Um, but. You know, it's, so, it's such an unknown. I, I don't know the best answer to that. Yes. 
Well, I believe it's the President of the Senate which assigns it to the various committees, and so any influence on him is what committees it goes to. And he's the chairman of the Committee on Committees. <laughs> but we hope that it will not go to four committees. That would be finished. Two is what we would like. Yes. What committee do you want it to go to? Well, <laughs> Senator Work has said that he feels it will go to conservation and then judicial. But which one would you like for it to go to? Do you have them? Yeah, it depends on who's on the committee. That's the. And when do we know who okay, yeah. will be assigned to the committee? I, I think that they will sign it. I talked to uh, Michael Padilla and Jacob Candelaria and asked them, do you have any idea what committee you're going to be on? And go, well, we want to be on this one, but we don't know. So but when do they make that I hope that the first two days of the session. I don't know. Do you know? Yeah, it'll, it should be the first week, first couple of days. Yeah, we hope. Yeah. Any other questions? So, yes. Carmen and I were, have been talking informally about starting a political action committee to work on this issue and possibly other sustainable food issues in the legislature, so I want to put out to everyone if that's something that you'd be interested in, in being involved with, that would mean registering with the Secretary of State and being able to solicit donations, and it would show that we have a more organized formula political action committee, which would show that we have a more or organized coalition to stand behind this bill rather than just individual constituents and existing groups so it would show a little bit more organization. So if people are interested in that, they can contact you. Okay, so I know we're all here for whatever reasons each of us have, um, but I assume that we are wanting to support and we're wanting to see labeling in the state of Mexico. Um, and you can all have access to the bill. It is on the website. If you need hard copies, I can send it to you. But most of the bill is definitions, and it does include feed. And I, 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 I have, I've gotten dozens of phone calls and emails since this time. I mean, I, I've been overwhelmed in a day. So there are, uh, uh, Hannah will be here in Santa Fe and parking herself somewhere. Uh, uh, she's just come into town yesterday, and so she will be hopefully the contact person for you, and I will be back and forth. So our first meet, and would you please hand out some petitions? If Sharon has, is from Taos, and Sharon is going to take petitions to various places and get them signed. Farmers markets, uh, food co-ops, places like that. Are, are good places to go. So if you would be willing to take petitions and do that and send them back to us, that is our initial way of building our membership so that we, we then have huge numbers of people when we speak to, to lawmakers. And yes. can people sign the petition online? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I can, I'll make sure of that. Um, so I'm not sure if today we can, but I'll, I'll make sure of that. So what I'm, I'm actually going to ask is that when, if you want our presenting position, if you could sign in here and say your name and your phone number, and um, then I can come up with the number. Or, or you can take the petition and just put the number at the end. Whatever. Right. True. Whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's true. Okay. Yes. I'm a... I, of course, am in support of the issue in general. I'm a little bit wary of, the, of New Mexico being the test case for this type of legislation. Because, you know, policy, I mean, the truth is the truth. Everyone should know what's in their food. But policy is a different animal because our food system's already entrenched. I'm thinking of Mr. Schwebeck, uh, Ryan Schwebeck, who's a farmer, grows conventional corn for dairy, also grows GMO corn. Now, when I went to this coexistence forum, you know, Mr. Schwebeck insisted that my farming practices be respected as a traditional, quote unquote, organic farmer, that he would never want to see my farming pot practices negatively impacted just because he decides to be a GMO farmer. That said, he doesn't want to see legislation that negatively impacts his choice to be a GMO farmer. 
So where so being a farmer, I know I've grown bolita beans on one side of my field and purple pod green beans on the other side. And guess what? Somehow a purple pod green bean ended up in my bolita beans that I supplied to a friend and then it contaminated contaminated her field. So you know I am not sure how this labeling plays out you know in reality you know in the day-to-day -day management of farmers such as Mr. Schwebeck and Mr. Mayberry who were on the panel with me at this conference you know me as a farmer part-time farmer family scale farmer you know it's a huge management issue because I conserve crops to keep crops separate and to have the infrastructure to do that so you know on that point alone I believe this bill will be killed because it, it is not known how this policy is going to affect the agricultural economy in New Mexico, which is hugely important. Now it says here, you know, that, uh, that it doesn't mean higher costs, it doesn't mean, you know, extra bureaucracy and all that. I don't buy that because I don't know how that plays out. This is going to be a test case. That's why I wanted this thing to pass in California. In California, it makes sense. California is the fifth largest economy in the world. New Mexico isn't. I'll bet we're not even on the list, You're right? We're already a struggling economy. So, you know, I'm not sure. I, I'm in support of the truth behind this, but I'm not sure if I'm in support of the actual policy because I'm thinking of other farmers who, you know, by no fault of their own, have become GMO farmers because they are on the commodity treadmill. And, you know, so the whole issue needs to be addressed at the federal level with the farm bill and all of these things. You know, our whole food system needs to be overhauled and I'm not sure that this piece of policy is going to advance, um, you know, what we want to see in the realm of policy. All of us can agree on the truth of the issue. But I'm wondering, uh, a piece of policy like this, you know, given that those unknowns exist, that's why this thing's probably going to be killed right away, and we're going to have to go back to the drawing board and flesh this out. And that's what my interest in this is, is, you know, the one concern I have, can this bill actually backfire on us? Can I, as a traditional farmer or an organic farmer, then be required to prove that I'm GMO free. I haven't looked at the language, I'm sorry, and uh, I'd like to look at it, but uh, but I know GMO testing is expensive. You know, it costs almost 500 bucks to, you gotta provide seven pounds of seed. That's like 10,000 kernels, and they'll tell you if three of them are contaminated. And, uh, but the burden of that, if, uh, if I, as a farmer, wanna know if I'm GMO free, that financial burden's on me. So is this going to put an unnecessary financial burden on people or not? You know, I don't know. And that's why I wish it would have passed in California because California has, you know, the luxury of size in terms of farms and money to figure that out. I'm not sure if our state can figure that out. Again, I'm into it for the educational effect on the citizenry. And so, you know, in general, I support it. But, you know, when the legislators bring up points, you know, the, the problem we had at farmer protection, farmer protection was trying to tell the feds how to litigate, you know, patent law. And that you can't do that. The state can't do that. So that when the 2010 version of the farmer protection bill was criticized by a senator, uh, a senator, and you know, and he had a valid criticism that was swept under the rug. But it was true, because that is the reality of policy. And so, you know, my recommendation would be, uh, you know, when these criticisms come up with these bills, you know, our legislators, we can pigeonhole them or whatever, but they are our leadership, and they are looking at this thing, a lot of them as lawyers, and their criticisms need to be taken with more than a grain of salt because this policy is going to have impact. And we're going to have to learn what those impacts are because I would say 99% of us in here are activists and 1% of us are farmers, just like in the country. 
and and I'll be damned if I'm going to support something that's going to hurt that one percent, even if they're GMO farmers. Because the fact of the matter is, is they are feeding our people. Yeah, thanks for that, Miguel. Um, what that brings up for me is that in order to push that federal legislation that you talk about, I think that these local initiatives that are happening now in 23 states around the country, even if they fail, even if the bill fails, will cause that sort of push on that federal legislation. And so I think that this is a really important initiative in that it will push that forward on that federal level. And the only way we're going to get movement on that federal level, because as we all know, the USDA and the FDA is pretty much owned by Monsanto, is if there's enough of a groundswell, grassroots groundswell, in enough states pushing this kind of bill. And so I think on that level, this initiative, this campaign is really important. And I also think that um, the food industry is changing. Having been in the food industry now, the organic food industry now for almost 40 years, um, I see the, ch the change in the food industry and the requirements of consumers. And there's already, as you can see from that poster, the non-GMO project that is certifying non-GMO foods around the nation, that retailers are being pushed by consumers to make sure that that testing is being done. And we get asked all the time. I mean, I get dozens of phone calls on a almost weekly basis asking, you know, does your new, does this new burritos thing have, um, you know, is the flax GMO, because that's one of the major uh, crops that's GMO. So um, I think that the only way to uh, get some movement, both in the industry and the larger industry, and um, on the federal level in policy, is to keep these grassroots initiatives going. And so I, for one, whether we win, whether this gets passed, whether it takes two years, five years, whatever it takes, and for the continuing push on these local levels. And, um, and also as a person who is a certified organic farmer for 10 years, um, I know that we already know that we have a series of record keepings that has to go on. And um, there are 50 countries in the world that already require labeling. So our commodity farmers are already requiring to do required to do labeling if they sell any of their product in Europe, if they sell any of their product in Japan. So that's already happening. And the big commodity farmers already do labeling. So if they, if they sell internationally. And so um, you know I, I think that we just keep putting, as you say, the education out there. And we continue to work on all of these levels to create that groundswell, to get what is our right as consumers, that right to know. So, but I, I do hear what you're saying, and I think you're right. And it is about relationship, totally about relationship. Yeah, and I want to thank you for bringing up all of these points also. And I think that one of the other aspects that we need to look at is health. You know, yes, there is a cost to the farmers. There's a cost to us in our health. Especially because we don't even have the health care in this country. But if we can reach out to healthcare workers who have some kind of data on how people are affected by GMO food, um, that might help just as another piece to bring to this. Um, I know personally from what I've been through with my son that there are places that are studying uh, neurological issues in children based solely on environment. So all they do is study how much does food, water, and air contribute to neurological issues in children, which are so much more rampant now. Um, Parents of children with neurological issues do have the right to know. They need to know. They need to know what not to put into their children's bodies. They're trying to help these kids get over this. Um, and it's not just that, it's health overall. So if we can reach out to 
our health care workers and our health care organizations to try to bring that in as a piece also. And that might help a little bit. Oh, well, I must say, uh, I think it's uh, helpful to know all of these points that Miguel is bringing up in terms of uh, the, uh, pursuing the legislation, but I think pursuing the legislation is one way to find out what modifications might be made that would make it more acceptable and, and more uh, useful and effective, even if it doesn't pass in this particular session. So I think it is definitely worthwhile going ahead and introducing this legislation and pursuing it. Uh, my understanding is that Europe uh, did a way Pastor, please. Europe, Europe uh, doesn't want GMO based on the precautionary principle, and I'm wondering if we are going beyond the precautionary principle and, and have the scientific facts. And this was asked of me today when I said I was coming to see you. Do you have any answers to that? Okay. Uh, I appreciate your point of view too, Miguel, being a manager at the community farm. Uh, but this has to do with a fundamental American freedom that's called freedom of information. And so to deny uh, a consumer or a rancher the option to know whether he's planting this or that is a fundamental right that we have to keep in mind in this democracy. This is freedom of information. So the consumer needs to be allowed to choose. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure we can all agree on that. But how that plays out is a more complicated policy issue. You know, there's no, so way that's predict, where, there's no way to predict, Miguel, pardon me for jumping in here, based on my age and my experience, there's no way to predict the outcome of anything. You have to let it fly, okay? And New Mexico is a, is a cowboy state, you know? It's going to do its own lawlessness no matter what law gets passed. <laughs> Let's see what happens on the legislative issue, they have a hard time enforcing the laws they got now. Let's just see what the feedback is, what the fallout is, and take it as it comes. That's my feeling. Okay, well my advice to you is, because that's what we did with farmer protection. In my opinion, we were so close to passing farmer protection, but the group of people who were rallied around farmer protection had their opinions about the senators and in my opinion shot themselves in the foot by a senator, I believe it was Senator Ryan, said this, le this legislation is meaningless because we are a state and it's telling the feds how to do it. My response to that was, well can we sit down Mr. Ryan and work together on this? And that's what my advice to you is, is you are going to come against opposition. If you pigeonhole the opposition just because they're Monsanto or just because they're biotechnology, you lost because you don't have the arguments. You want to bring up Percy Schmeiser? Guess what? They got their arguments on that. They, ha they have it all laid out. So that's not the way to win. The way to win is to listen to the opposition, embrace it, and and follow the thread, as opposed to drawing the line in the sand, which I've seen a, a thousand times before, and saying, you know, we've done our homework, we got the truth on our side, and these legislators aren't going to work with us, so, you know, they're full of it, and we're going to work around them. And to me, that's not the way to get things done. Well, I, I think your point is very well taken, and, you know, we, we need your, your experience and your input. Um, I'm not suggesting that we do draw a line in the sand. Uh, I, I do think it's important to identify uh, who needs to be have a conversation with. And we, as a group, Food and Water Watch as an organization, we, as community members, we will have that conversation. And we will continue it to 
where, wherever it needs to go. And um, I, I know that there have been other pieces of legislation introduced here in the past. It's important that we don't make the same mistakes, so I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, uh, we will do our best not to, to do those things that have happened in the past, and I uh, will count on you to, to keep an eye on that. Uh, we do want to have that conversation. We do want to extend our hand out to however people feel, however lawmakers feel, however farmers, consumers feel. Uh, and that's why this is a, a simple amendment. And it's purely consumer right to know. And uh, that's why we are keep, keeping it focused on that at this point. And I want to say something about the federal. This is an issue that is not going to be dealt on the federal level. We couldn't even get a farm bill. So that's why it's coming up for the states. It's kind of like gay marriage. I mean, it's the people who want to see this. And uh, I don't know who Robin, you were saying, or Carmen, you were saying that, that uh, this is how the consumer, this is what the consumer wants. And so this is really a grassroots effort. And so farmers, lawmakers, they're all part of the people. So we need to keep an eye very close to these these cautions that you are giving us so that we don't make those mistakes. So thank you for, for bringing that up. And, uh, we will be very vigilant for these things. And uh, I will educate myself further on this. Yes. I just wanted to throw out that I think I think that the GMO issue allows us to address many fundamental issues and that if we can stay on those really fundamental, our right to know, our democratic right to grow what we want, to get information, all of that, that we have an opportunity to pretty much call the lawmakers on upholding our rights as citizens and not turn it into an us against them. But at some point, we have to stand up and say, as citizens of the country and as citizens of the state, we don't have to just bow to corporate power. And, I, and, and not that we address it that way, but that I think that's really the fundamental issue. And I think we have to realize that we may not win the first time, and we've been through these battles with Big Ag and all these other companies, but that's what's going on on every critical issue in America, from big pharma to military spending and all of that. And we have to stop kind of kowtowing because the corporate powers have so much power. And I don't think we have, we have to understand where they're coming from. But I don't think we have to embrace it. I don't want to embrace my fear of having GMOs in it and my not knowing. But when we get to the real fundamental issues and we call these legislators and we say, you know, I have a right to, and have a list, you know, not needing to have extra health care because I'm being polluted by food and on and on and on. I think we have a different kind of ground that we come together at. And it's more our fundamental constitutional rights living in this country. And maybe we have to really hold people to that, to say, if this is what this country is about, then we're headed the wrong direction. I, I do agree with. I understand like the general about the general salary that a farmer has, and it's it sucks. It's really low. And, um, but I think that yeah. But we need the red to know. We need to continue with this pressure. And with with the whole drawing drawing a line in the sand, we need to we need to present our facts with as with like not biased opinion and let them choose for themselves. And I think if, if we present the facts as non-biased, but it's on both sides, their side and our side, then I believe that we can actually gain a lot more support and people will actually uh, choose the right side, which is the side that we try to portray. Yeah, I think one of the things we can do in the community right now is they don't allow the public to speak, is we can make uh, really brightly colored t-shirts that says something simple like yes to SB18 and if we're not allowed to speak we all just coordinate and sit and stand up. It's just another way of speaking without speaking. Yeah. So before even we get to the committee, um, could we put together a little mini sort of fact sheets or informational educational pieces that if we 
think that it's going to the conservation community that talk about the effects on the environment of what we do know has happened in other states when um, a lot of GMO crops have been planted, the effects of the super weeds, the increase in the amount of uh, pesticides and herbicides, herbicides specifically, that um, the increasing use of that, so that we can say, well, this is about, this is the conservation community, and if we want to conserve the land and the soil and the water of New Mexico, here are some of our concerns why we're asking for this bill. Um, so that we get to those legislators before they even get to the media and we have to show our teachers. You know, so that we've already done that education with who's ever on that committee in advance. Uh, in my experience, I don't agree with that. Do not. You will get killed. You know, you unless you have a PhD scientist who's published and respected as your expert witness and your speaker, don't do it because they'll pull it as soon as you pull out that then they're going to pull out the big guns to me this is an issue of labeling of right to know period as soon as you start talking about environmental effects super weeds unknown health effects it's over because you don't you just you just spread out your message the right to know message is very concise, it's very clear, stick to it, it's good enough. As soon as you start bringing in all of these other things that can be contested, you're muddling up the issue, you're clouding the issue, and then they're going to get stuck on those issues, and then it's just going to go around, and then it's, the time's going to run out, and it's dead. That's, that's my opinion. If you really want this thing to pass, the best chance of it flying is you stick to your talking point, one point which is the right to know, and like I said in an email, if you're on the email, get a label from your mattress and take it into the session and say, look at everything that's required on a mattress. You're sleeping on top of this mattress, and there's more information about the type of mattress that you're sleeping on than the type of food you're putting in your body, period. Because I tell you, as soon as you bring up, you know, Roundup Ready effects on soil, as soon as you bring up, you know, contamination, Percy Schmeiser, this, that, the other, you just clouded the issue, you lost the attention, you lost the focus, and it's not, to me, in my opinion, that's good for activism, it's good for educational forums, but for policy, stick to the point. That's that's my opinion, and, and uh, you but know, don't and... Don't you think we run into the problem of one of the lobbyists saying that materially there's no difference? So why do we have a right to know what's in it if there's really no difference? So we need to say... I can't hear you. I was saying that the argument that's been made is that the food is not materially different, whether it's GMO or not, and so right. or whatever the term is that they use. Well, I'll tell you the silver bullet on that one. Say, if they're so substantially equivalent, why do you have patents on them? Okay, you, you know, And then you're done. And then you're done. Do not engage in the controversy. Once you engage in the controversy, you lost. So we do want to be focused on right to know. This is purely a right. consumer-driven bill. It has nothing to do with farmers, so to speak. But that it has to be our focus. And, and I, I would like to be, you all to be really clear in your minds when you talk to people. This is what you said. It's our fundamental right of information. And so I, I want to thank you all for coming. I just want to give Hannah a minute here. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Um, uh, thanks again for everybody for coming. I think that um, we got into a really cool discussion today about uh, kind of our tactics around lobbying this issue. But one thing to remember is that um, what we as the citizen group are going to be doing is building power for this. So, you know, the other side on this has the money. They have so much more money than we'll ever be able to even compete with. And so, but we, we do definitely have the people across the U.S. on our side. Um, and so, you know, we're not even going to be focusing that much on the lobbying. I mean, uh, I don't know will be, but, but we are going to be building up power in those communities um, that, uh, that the senators are responsible to um, so that they know that, that this is an issue that, that people here care about. So, that being said, uh, tomorrow I'm going to be um, out here um, collecting petitions from, from citizens in the, in the area. Um, I was actually going to ask you if we could do it in front of, um, in front of the market uh, here, um, but we also might do it somewhere else. Uh, but if you're interested in helping to coming out and helping to collect petitions out on the street, 
Um, you should talk to me because I'll be doing that tomorrow. Um, but also, we're going to be building up to a um, broader community kickoff meeting on the 23rd. Um, and we don't have a place for it yet, but it'll be on the 23rd. Um, and I have all of your contact info, so I'll let you guys know about that. But I just wanted to give you a heads up. Um, uh, so my name's Hannah Snyder, um, and I will be emailing all of you. I they, the, My Food and Water Watch email is a little bit wonky right now, so I don't want to give it out right now. But um, but uh, I'll, I'll be getting in touch with all of you. Um, and then the last thing is if you uh, haven't grabbed petitions yet, grab them from me, and um, I'll write down how many you grabbed so I can collect them from you. Can we, we make more copies? Business cards. I can email you a PDF petition if you'd like. And if you need to contact me, please do. Uh, without you, we can do nothing. So thank you. And if people just stop buying it, it doesn't get passed, well, then we get them in the pocketbook, and that's what it counts. Right. So I have some materials that um, earlier I got a group email that informed me about this meeting. I wasn't sure how many people I replied to all, but um, you know we have a memorial that was passed in 2007 that references our right to know. You know, so I'd like to send people that memorial. It was interesting at that time. Our uh, Secretary of Agriculture was Miley Gonzalez. And he was not open to our perspective. Our current Secretary of Agriculture is Jeff Weedy, and I find him a very open and approachable person who um, who will listen. As far as I can tell, he seems a lot. In my opinion, he's a lot better Secretary of Ag than the last one we had. I think you're right. And uh, and because he held this coexistence forum. And he didn't have to, and uh, and I've spoken with him, and that, and you know, so I think he is one that definitely needs to be approached, and uh, and who knows, maybe on his wallet uh, or his dime and time, you know, he would host some type of forum to where we could dialogue this thing out. I think he's very open to dialogue, you know. Then there's the Farmer Protection Act. Uh, for the Native American community, we have the Seed Sovereignty Declaration. The Seed Sovereignty Declaration was signed by the All Indian Pueblo Council, by eight Northern Pueblos, by the National Congress of American Indians, you know, and it actually went worldwide. And it was part of this area. So, you know, that's a fundamental thing that's a feather in our cap, you know, because unlike other states, you know, this isn't just a consumer issue, this is a sovereignty issue. Now, again, in terms of messaging, I'm not sure we want to get into that no, because this really is don't. about labeling. But about if, if Native Americans were to step up themselves and say, this is a sovereignty issue for me as a Native American, you know, I have the right to eat the way I want to eat, to grow my crops, period. You know, I think Native American especially leadership could say that. The rest of us, you know, we probably don't want to play that card. We just want to stick with the, you know, right to know stuff. But I think strategy is going to be hugely important to gaining any traction on this.